The first painting arrived to the museum in 1998. Not only was it the first masterpiece, the first big masterpiece to enter our collection of European art, it was quite an event because this painting has disappeared from view for over 211 years. Where was the painting found? In 1995, a man called Ernest Onions died and left in his will a lot of paintings that were hoarded in his storage room to be sold through Christie's or Sotheby's. Christie's didn't want to uh, take the lot, but Sotheby's did. And this painting, which had a little label saying it was done by Pietro Testa and featured the sack of the African city of Cartago, was sold to a company called Hazelin Gooden and Fox for 155,000 pounds. Later on, when they started cleaning the painting, they found out that it was actually a lost painting by the French painter Nicolas Poussin depicting the sack and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. As you can see very well, this is Titus, the Roman commander, later to be an emperor. And the fact that the seven candelabra menorah was lost uh, from uh, the eyes of the experts is quite a thing. Um, three years of restoration and cleaning of this painting and mending it because there were many tears in it ended up in a four and a half million value. The next painting to enter the collection and to make us very happy came from Judy and Michael Steinhardt during the second Intifada. The mystery here is a little different. It's not like cool. the open mystery of the, for, the former painting, what happened uh, during 200 years of a lost uh, track of a painting. Here we have a different question. Take a look at these three uh, images done by different artists, but all through the time when Rembrandt was active in painting as well. One of them, going from left to right, shows us St. Peter in prison being rescued by the angel while the guards are asleep. The second painting shows us the penitent St. Peter in the house of Caiaphas after Christ was crucified and he denied knowing Christ. Christ told him, when the cock will crawl for three times in the morning, you will penitent for that you have denied me. And here we see the saint with his keys, with his clasped hands, and with the big chicken behind him. Third option is the option that shows us St. Peter in prison, but in Rome before he was crucified. So let's go back to our little man here. What do we really see? Is it Jerusalem? Is it just before the angel is going to rescue him? Is it the situation at Caiaphas' courtyard when he is sorry for what he said for denying Christ? Or is it really the last minute before he's taken to be crucified? We don't know, and we're not supposed to know. That was what Rembrandt aimed at. He wanted it to be ambiguous. He wanted it to be an answer to all three possible questions of which scene is he depicting? Because what Rembrandt wanted to show us is not the exact moment in the stories of the disciples of Christ. He wanted to show us emotion. He wanted to show us a game of light and shadow. He wanted to show us an old man in a moment between faith and the loss of faith. And above all, he wanted to show us humanity. Next is a different altogether painting. And you can see that the question here is, where are the children? We only see a small toddler, and we see many um, people in the ages of between their 20s, their 40s, and actually the man in the middle in his 80s, but we don't see any children, because sadly enough, even though it's a very merry painting, the children died in the plague. There was a plague in Antwerp, where Jordans painted this amazing painting, and the plague took the children. And when they went back to normal life, there were already babies around, but there was uh, 
quite a group of the ages of three to 15 that were no longer in the city. Your dance depicts his father ruler, Adam van Noort, as the king of the celebration. He also shows us himself. He is in the middle. And there's also Elizabeth, his daughter, who later died at the young age. This is Adam van Noort. He's 81 year old. It's the last year of his life. And he is chosen to be the king for a day in the Epiphany celebration. This guy over here is, of course, your dance. This is his son, Jacob Jr., who will also die rather young. This is Elizabeth. And the rest is the Mary family who celebrates life, celebrates the end of Christmas, and hopes for better days as we all do. All of you know that painting. I think whoever has been to the museum even once remember this painting because for many, many years until the Poussin reached our um, collection, this was the only masterpiece we had. And every child in the youth wing uh, knew all about Dutch art, learning from those two painters who did the paintings together. The father, Jakob Gerritz Kuyp, who was the portrait painter, and his son, Albert, who did the background. But this is not the real story behind the painting. The painting used to belong to the family of Eduard and Alphonse Sinder Rothschild. And they lost it during the Second World War because the person who wanted the painting for his very own museum was Hitler. And as you can see here, here are the salt mines on the border between Germany and Austria into where these paintings, uh, were con which were confiscated by the Nazis, were taken. Among them, our very own painting. By the end of the war, the war hero, Rose Valland, who was part of the French um, underground, was part of the team that rescued this painting and returned it to the family. When Guy and Alix de Rochi decided to perhaps um, leave each other and sell their collection, they sold the painting and the guy behind the whole intersection was Jonah Fischer's father. Dr. Maurice Fischer was the first ambassador of Israel to France after the independence war. And he encouraged them to buy the painting for the Israel Museum to be. And the painting reached Israel for the opening of the museum in 1965. A similar but a little different story keeps us at the same period of time, both because the painter is again Albert Coy, and because this beautiful couple, a painter and his young wife, she's really a doll, um, was part of the collection of a nice couple from the Netherlands who lived in Brussels. Uh, Hugo Andresi was Dutch. He married Elizabeth. They had no children, but they had a beautiful collection of at least 60 paintings and tapestries. They escaped to New York in 1939, leaving all their possessions in the hands of the curators of the Royal Museum of Belgium in Brussels. Soon enough, the painting was confiscated, but this time, not for the Linz Museum, as did the painting before, but for Goering's private collection and was sent by him from France to where it was transported to his second wife, Emmy, and the daughter, Ida, who we can see here, at the castle in which they resided. The painting was found there by the Americans and restituted to Elizabeth Andriessi. Elizabeth lived to a long age and in 63, when she died, she gave it to the New Israel Museum together with five other works of art. What are we actually looking at? And who actually did this painting? Is it Artemisia, the queen who, after her husband slash brother was killed in a war, grinded his corpse and drank his ashes daily? Kind of a gruesome um, recipe to live by, but she did that, and you can see the cup in which she put the ashes of her husband and diluted it with wine until she died herself. 
So is it her? Or could it be that this is Mary Magdalene, the penitent Mary Magdalene, whose box of jewelry is just behind her, full of those beautiful things she received while she was a high-class prostitute? But there's another question concerning this painting. Who painted it? Nowadays, researchers said it was done by, well, not a very well-known painter by the name of Adam Camerarius, who lived in Chronin. But could it be that this was actually a work of his teacher, Yaakov Bakker, who was a pupil of Rembrandt? We don't really know. What we do know is that Gayford Steinberg, an old-time friend of the Israel Museum, was very kind to give it to us a few years ago. This painting shows us a nice situation in a city in Brabant. A couple of people are standing and looking at a nun spitting frogs uh, while a um, sort of um, anti-Semitic caricature of a magician is uh, playing with balls and has an owl in his basket and a little dog that looks like uh, a fox underneath his table. Here we can see a dentist. These little things are tooth uh, on his table. And behind him there's a stable with an ox and a donkey singing songs from some kind of a page of lyrics. As you can see, this guy who's supposed to be uh, a monk is stealing the nun's purse. And the boy who sees everything doesn't say anything. But what actually happened here with the wall? I was always worried about the wall thing because the wall seems to me like it was planted and not part of the actual painting. So I searched, and this is what I found. The last painting by Bosch, well, alas, it's lost. But if we look at other depictions, there are five in the world, it shows us that there was not supposed to be a town behind it. And the print that was done after the original painting also show us that it was a much larger composition and the city is only far behind, and we don't see the hanging man who's being punished for something. What are we going to do about this? Well, we're going to have a new equipment one day soon in the museum where we can x-ray this painting and finally find out what's behind the wall. Two wonderful sculptures came from Jose Mugrabi, our friend, and they depict the faith. The faith are the Greek, Lachesis, and Anthropos who are in charge of a man's life. But actually, there should have been three. And in all depictions, there are always three. And you can see Clothos, the one in the background, uh, as the third faith who takes care of man's life. So what happened here? Where is the third sculpture? We're a group of curators who've been trying to figure it out for quite some time now. Each museum have one sculpture. We're actually the only lucky one to have two sculptures. None of them have the third. So could it be that the artist who did the two sculptures died before completing the third? Could it be that somebody didn't pay for the commission and the sculpture stopped in the middle? We don't really know. What we do know is that it could have been a sculptor from the school of Michelangelo. Some others say it might have been from the school of Bernini. Others say maybe it's something that we still need to find out, perhaps Dutch, perhaps Spanish. We've all been working on these sculptures for quite some time. So if something comes up to your mind, if you've seen something similar, if you know of something I should be looking at, don't hesitate to let me in. In his years uh, as a very famous French academic painter, as the head of the French Academy in the Salon, Jean-Léon Jérôme, like many Orientalists, came to visit um, Palestine, he traveled to Egypt, he traveled to Syria, and he came to the uh, city of Jerusalem. And he depicted the city of Jerusalem in two paintings. One of them uh, was very famous. It showed uh, a group of people praying in front of the Western Wall. And uh, most of the time, uh, it was a relatively, um, not a very original painting, but this is not an ordinary Jew. This is the wandering Jew, or as we also call him, the eternal Jew. 
And here I want to show you something. Who is the eternal Jew? It's that cobbler who told Christ when he was asking for some water uh, upon his Via Dolorosa on his way to the crucifixion, as you can see him on the uh, left-hand side. He said to him, oh, oh, go and be crucified. And Christ said to him, I may go, but you will never stay. You will always roam the earth. And until my second coming, you will know no peace. And ever since then, the story tells us, this eternal Jew is roaming the world, trying to find a place for his own, and will not sit quietly until the second coming of Christ. During the 19th century, with the rays of anti-Semitism, there were a lot of depictions of the eternal Jew. And most of the time, they looked like this guy from England or this guy from France. I want you to pay attention to this little guy because he's interesting. They both wear a green coat. They both have this little pekele. The wandering Jew also has his stick or cane. He has this high top head. And if you can see from where you're sitting, he has a red beard. Remember who had a red beard? It was Judah Ishkrayot, Ishkrayot. The eternal Jew in the eyes of Jerome is not just the Jew in front of the Wailing Wall trying to uh, pray quietly, maybe before or after everybody knows. He's the man who knows no peace and will probably know no peace as long as Christ is not back. That's why even here, he did not come from home. He's walked the mile and he's going to continue afterwards to take his things and go and roam around.